Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be doing a deck profile here for my Vampire Commander deck. Now this is the first time I'm doing a deck profile for a Commander deck. Sure, I've opened up decks before for Commander in terms of sealed product, but I've never actually showcased my own build before. So I am definitely going to be a bit nervous on this here, uh, just because it's so subjective because of the diverse price range as well as the diverse card pool within Commander itself as a format. So with all that hectic stuff, it does make it seem like any deck could be wrong, but at the same time, it could also mean that any deck could be right as well. But that's sort of the fun with the format is that you could sort of build anything to your liking. It's just that you do have to be careful at a certain period of time uh, based on what you might be playing. But with that being said, this particular deck here, I originally bought the Crimson Vow Vampire deck and that was definitely something I was excited for. I really love vampires and it was something I knew I really wanted to build. At that time, the featured card of Crimson Vow was Olivia and I knew I wanted to center my deck around her. So by having the pre-constructed commander deck, I was already part way through. All I needed to do was switch out my commander and then some other cards in my deck as well and I would actually establish something that I would be satisfied with. So with that being said, just a rough estimate, I'd say I'd put in about $150 to $200 into this deck, give or take. That is including the actual commander deck itself as well. So clearly I haven't spent too much money on this deck itself, but with that being said, to each their own right. Everyone can build anything in their own style, in their own way. And this is something that I've been really enjoying playing. So yeah, without further ado, we'll get started. Of course, if you guys do end up liking this video, drop a like, share, comment, subscribe. It really does matter. It really does help out the channel. And I'm also open to feedback as well. So if you wanna share your own profiles or your own deck lists, please post them down in the comments down below. It would help out not only myself, but everyone else who might be interested in this deck. But with that being said, let's get started. So to begin, I did want to talk about these three cards, just because these are the three cards that are played in the deck itself. However, they are interchangeable. So it is going to be a red black deck. And with this particular build, I am able to flexibly change up the commander based on whatever I'm feeling. So Olivia herself allows you to cheat out vampires from the graveyard, whereas with Strafan you can essentially cheat out vampires from the hand. Uh, both are definitely very well uh, worth it in terms of what they're capable of doing. Olivia will slightly be better in this case. However, that being said, I must admit, sometimes I do have a bit of trouble actually getting vampires into the graveyard. So, if you're unable to fuel up your graveyard, then Olivia doesn't really work out well, does it? But at the same time, if you don't have any vampires in the hand, Strafan is kind of pointless. Also, Strafan does have a requirement that you need to sacrifice at least two blood tokens to be able to whip out one of your vampires for free. So it's not necessarily a free cheat, but in a sense it is. It's just that Olivia is better in this case. Now with Angie, Maid of Dishonor, it's just a really nice card to allow you to constantly generate blood tokens. And that's one potential strategy you could go with this deck. It's not my primary strategy, but blood tokens does help you to fill your graveyard by discarding cards into your grave. So these are the cards that essentially are possible to be interchanged as my commanders. And I definitely think that they all have a very fair cost. Olivia costs more to play out, but that's okay because her effect essentially gets you free stuff. Next up, I did want to talk about the two Olivias here. 
These are two alternate Olivias that you can actually also technically play as the commander, but I never will just because they are not ideal in this particular case. What they can actually do, it's not so much. They are pretty costly for what they are, and normally you want to bring them out by actually cheating them out via either Strafan or your own main Olivia Crimson Bride. But of course, I really do like Olivia, and as a result, I'm choosing to play two more copies of her. I'm looking forward to the actual new one though, um, so yeah, definitely going to be exciting. Looking forward to getting that new precon. So to wrap up with the dual colored uh, creatures, we have here Stormfist Crusader and the two versions of Ghana. This is definitely a really you know it's a really interesting type of deck because i have so many different strategies that's actually incorporated into this i have an artifact strategy where i am able to utilize the blood tokens and use them as mana to cast out more creatures or cast more spells but at the same time i also then have other stuff that allows me to sort of uh, burn my opponents uh, one by one at a time and uh, you could sort of see just by their actual effects in each of these that they uh, can definitely uh, slowly get rid of your opponent's life. You know, it's better not to focus on one target. As a vampire player, you should be, well, it's my opinion of course, but I believe that uh, as a vampire player, I want to be hitting everyone equally to not draw out any sort of attention. And by balancing out all your damage amongst all the other players you're at least able to eventually get to that point where everyone will lose at the same time all the while you can then you know close out the victory all right so next up we're going to be focusing on eight cards here now i did want to go with multiple cards at a time just because it is a 100 card deck after all so it's better I just go over everything as fast as possible here so that the video doesn't end up being too long. So I'm playing, starting from the top left, we have Malakia Blood Priest. Uh, just right next on the right is Gluttonous Guest, uh, Yeheni Undying Partisan, Onrika Domnathi. Then on the bottom left, we have Vampire Spawn, uh, followed by Falcon Wrath, Forebear, Innocent Traveler, and Sanctum Seeker. These particular cards are all pretty much the lower cost vampires that I have in black that I can actually just bring out via my normal means of mana. But with that being said though, once you get into the higher end, that's where you sort of want to cheat out. But at least in this line here, everything here I usually will just cast out by myself just because they are all still relatively low cost maybe with the exception of the Sanctum Seeker. But uh, all of them do have a strategy of essentially slowly dealing damage into your opponents. Uh, there's really not much else to say. All of them sort of do the same thing, but in very different ways. Moving on to the next set of eight cards, we have Blood Craze Socialites, Malachia Blood Witch, Drana Calistria Blood Chief, Bloodline Necromancer, and then on the bottom, we have Blood Tracker, Anna Wan the Ruined Sage, Blood Tithe Collector, and Nirkana Revenant. All of these cards are much higher costs, and similar case, they do quite literally the same thing. Of course, more unique effects like Flying and Lifelink, which is common traits that you will see in Vampires anyway, but uh, you know, each of these do have tiny unique eccentricities that sort of uh, make them very important. For example, the Blood Teeth Collector is uh, capable of, well, forcing the opponent to discard a card, or Anna One, which forces the opponents to sacrifice a non-vampire creature. You know, so all of these cards can be problematic, and the thing that is, if you're actually focusing on your commander, which is Olivia Crimson Bride, to cheat out these vampires each and every time will definitely make it very difficult for your opponent to actually deal with. 
So just to end things off with my black cards here, we have Crossway Troublemakers, Butcher of Malachia, Patron of the Vein, and Soren Markov as a Planeswalker. Now, the first three cards that I just mentioned are pretty much self-explanatory. They are actually quite staples in terms of many vampire builds, and so I feel like I don't really have to explain too much of them. The Soren Markov is a bit of a fun card that I've actually decided to play in this particular deck. It's not the most amazing, just because it's not even a vampire that can, I can really call out with the Olivia. But at a 6 cost, to be able to potentially just uh, scare your opponents and just potentially win the game, uh, it's definitely quite nice. You know, like, straight up, let's say you're near the end of the game and you have one more opponent left to deal with. Sora and Markov can just come out and force your opponent's life down to 10 immediately. And then from that, it only takes a few vampires to finish off the opponent. So it's a, a very nice trump card that I like to sort of hold back until the end. Uh, definitely poor strategizing, but look, ultimately I'm here to have fun. Alright, so moving on to red creature spells. Uh, this is definitely quite interesting, so I'm going to start off from, again, the top left. We have Voldaren Epicure, then we have on the right Reckless Fireweaver, Unruly Catapult, Falcon Wrath Celebrant, Blood Petal Celebrant, Scion of Opulence, Dominating Vampire, Markov Enforcer, and of course right in front of us we have Olivia's Attendant. These are all the red creature spells that I'm playing, not as many as the black, but with that being said, these are definitely still great to pretty much just uh, start things off here. Now, that being said, only the first three red cards are actually something that I would personally play out by casting through normal means. But when it comes to, say, the final cards down the bottom, the final five at least, uh, they are just much more costly and as a result they're most likely going to be cheated out via Olivia's effect. That being said, it is well worth it. They are very powerful cards and uh, as a result I've uh, chosen to play them in the deck. One of the favorite mechanics that I personally like with this is uh, the Menace, which definitely is a powerful effect if we're playing in the early game. Alright, now with all the creature spells out of the way, we now have uh, instance sorceries and then we'll eventually move on to enchantments as well. But in terms of the two uh, dual colored ones, we have Rakdos Charm and Terminal Agony on uh, both on the left side. But yeah, they're just uh, really great cards. One has madness, the other can essentially just exile stuff from the uh, target player's graveyard so yeah definitely very powerful each and every one of these cards are also well let's just go over the black cards we have rowan's grim search arterial flow pointed discussion vampire's kiss victimize and ambition's cost most of these cards allow me to either replenish my cards or uh, deal more damage onto the opponent some of these also act as means of inconveniencing your opponent. So for example, Arterial Flow allows each opponent to discard two cards, definitely inconvenient. And we have Victimize, choose two target creatures in your graveyard, you sacrifice a creature and if you do, return the chosen card to the battlefield tapped. That is uh, sort of like an indirect means of inconvenience in your opponent. If your opponent has worked hard to sort of get rid of one of your pesky cards, you could simply bring it back via the victimize. Definitely very nice here. All right, moving on, we have our next set of eight cards. We have Eggers Awakening. We have Kindred Dominance, Painful Quandary, Pyroblast, Eldritch Pact, Faith of the Devoted, Blood Fountain, and Right of Flame. All of these cards are again similar case, they are much higher cost cards. So if we're looking at Edgar's Awakening, it's bringing back one of your cards. Kindred Dominance allows you to destroy a bunch of stuff that's, uh, well, most likely not vampires. Painful Quandary is allowing a player to lose 5 life or to this card a card if they want to cast any spell. 
so again more inconveniences pyroblast and rites of flame are both actually just really nice cards um, from the chandra spellbook whereas uh, pyroblast acts sort of like a means to negate stuff rites of flame allows you to then add more mana so definitely fantastic there and same thing applies one of the most notable here that i want to bring up is faith of the devoted so whenever you cycle or discard a card you may pay one if you do each opponent loses two life and you gain two life and that is a card that i specifically really wanted to add to this particular deck only because we are playing blood tokens and when you're playing blood tokens you're going to be cycling cards a lot so faith of the devoted is definitely maximizing its use here and the last of our red sorceries and enchantments we have here so starting off from the top left we have cathartic reunion blood brotherhood's end mob rule impact tremors smash to dust fiery confluence blasphemous acts curse of hospitality and stencia masquerade all of these cards are again just uh, leaning more towards a bit of a costly side depending on what you want to go with blasphemous act obviously a really good card to just get rid of everything you want uh, cathartic reunion allowing you to replenish cards but also fuel your graveyard as a means to obviously make uh, olivia more active we have uh, cards like fiery confluence uh, and also smash to dust or brotherhood's end they allow us to either deal more damage either by you know getting rid of uh, permanents on the board or by actually dealing literal damage um, and of course uh, mob rule allowing you to just gain creatures and potentially finish games off same thing applies with the stencia masquerade so all of that serves uh, enough of a purpose here all right so now we're starting to get to that point where we're looking at more of the familiar cards here that almost every deck would play but firstly i will go over there is sanguine statuettes on the top left there uh, it's just one of the uh, other artifacts that allows you to essentially bring out more blood tokens now i also want you to take a look at the bottom row but the third card so the second card to the right which is inspiring statuary this is definitely a powerful card because it allows non-artifact spells uh, to use improvise which essentially allows all of your artifacts to be using uh, themselves as mana uh, definitely very powerful because we are playing a lot of artifacts remember it's a blood token deck and so with that being said uh, just looking at the sanguine statuette that's uh, instantly two mana that you have for the cost of zero really um i mean you're paying two you're getting two uh so it's a net zero but the fact that you always have it every turn it's definitely going to be beneficial there so inspiring statuary is uh, one of those cards that i found to be uh quite helpful in this particular deck here uh basic stuff like soul ring arcane signet raktos signet they're all great as well as artifacts but the thing is this because I'm utilizing this artifact strategy to gain more mana, uh, those particular cards become so much more valuable. Uh, one of the most um, notable ones is Cryptolith Fragment, which uh, most vampire decks will be playing it. So uh, yeah, definitely a very nice card that every vampire deck should have. And then of course for lands, we're playing basic stuff like Path of Ancestry, uh, Crystal Grotto, Bets, of course, Command Tower, we can't forget about that. Now, to wrap up the lands, we do have here Myriad Landscape, If Near Deadlands, Bajuka Bog, Smoldering Marsh, Shadow Blood Ridge, Tainted Peak, Cabal Pit, Castle Dracula or Voldaren Estate. We have Rakdos Canarium, Geothermal Bog, Foreboding Ruins, and Temple of Malice. All of these cards essentially allow you to get uh, either your red or black mana onto the board and uh, that's essentially what we have if there are more versions out there go for it add it to the deck because uh, that's what we want we want as many cards that give both synergy to the Rakdos engine and to wrap things up we're going to be playing here eight black and nine red mana so yeah it's just a matter of what you actually want to have a preference for 
uh, but this is something that works for me. So yeah, with that being said, this was essentially it for the deck profile. I know it was definitely very long, but hey, that's a hundred cards in the deck, so it wasn't going to be a short video. Of course, this is the first time I'm actually doing this, so I'll definitely look into uh, different ways of profiling a commander deck in the future because I definitely have other decks out there that I'll definitely love to showcase. So yeah, I hope you guys all enjoyed this. Definitely give me some feedback on this. I want to hear about it. Of course, join the Discord as well. Uh, it's definitely something I'd like to have extended discussions on. But with that being said, thanks for joining me today. I hope you all have a fantastic day. I'll see you all next time.